Yeah. Last night, we had the pleasure of seeing American Society of Magical Negroes, starring Justice Smith. It's directed by Kobe Libby, a first-time director, weirdly enough. I just found that out. Actor before that, so yeah. I was in doubt. In yeah, a couple of other so things. this was a first directorial debut. And essentially, this is about a timid beta male who just so happens to be black and he's also a shitty modern artist he makes yarn sculptures that are really bad and to be fair that's actually played as a joke that like yeah. he thinks they're bad too i wasn't yeah. sure because yeah. this is being made this is a movie being made by pretentious art nerds presumably they would think that shitty modern art yarn sculptures are actually good so anyway <laughs> he is a doormat and he feels that he uh, is constantly underestimated. And Literally the whole movie could stop if the dude stood, stood up for himself a single time. Oh no, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I think he's not underestimated and he has no artistic talent and he's very accurately evaluated for not being talented. But anyway, he's followed home by this older black man who kind of forcibly recruits him into the American Society of Magical Negroes and they're this secret magical society of black people that follow white people around as their clients mm -hmm. and they're tasked with making white people comfortable because as the trailer said white people are the most dangerous creatures on earth and really bad shit can happen when white people are uncomfortable they can just commit mass shootings and stuff i mean that wasn't explicitly said but we know the implication mm -hmm. so they forcibly recruit him into this society and he kind of doesn't fight it because he again is a, a timid beta male doormat so they show him in training this venn diagram where you have to be both authentically black and acceptable to whites it's a very delicate balance i could literally feel the <laughs> college critical theory papers being written yeah. as we were doing this yeah. <laughs> oh yeah and for context obviously the magical negro trope is uh definitely something that's talked about in film schools mm -hmm. um you're warned about this mm -hmm. Like, I guess Gone with the Wind would include this. Green Mile, there's a lot of them. Legend of Vagger Le Bands. Legend yeah. of Vagger Bands. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of movies that include this trip. Though I did see somebody make a great point today online. They said, is Tommy Lee Jones the magical cracker from <laughs> Men in Black? Black. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you tell I, me. I assume that none of you in the chat are planning to see this movie, so we're just going to go ahead and spoil everything. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, but not a you whole don't want to see spoil. this movie. Let yeah. me, let me offer um, they the... sent him to work at this tech yeah. startup with a bunch of millennials, and his client is one of his coworkers named Jason, I think. Mm -hmm. He has a work wife named Lizzie, and he has this conflict within him because he's falling in love with Lizzie, but he has to make sure that Jason is comfortable at all times, and that presents uh, a conflict of interest. Overall... Um, I think this is mildly amusing in some parts, to be fair, yes. mm -hmm. but also mildly annoying in others. And all of the incendiary racial rhetoric about white people, it doesn't make me feel any type of way. Because if you go into the movie... We've heard it all before. If you mm -hmm. go into the movie bracing yourself for the extremely racist rhetoric, it will wash over you a lot cleaner mm -hmm. it won't bother you as much if you went into this movie with no knowledge of what this was about you would find well, the this title kind of gives a little bit away the, but. you would find this absolutely infuriating like I, I pointed out before i watch like if i saw this rhetoric in a show that i usually like it would be far more infuriating than seeing it in a movie where i was <laughs> expecting it from the very beginning i think the sad part is it just lacks a whole ton of creativity on top of all the racism so the the scenes where they're actually at the 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 magical uh, it's not it's not a it's a facility it's black like, hogwarts it, yes yeah. Uh, yeah. at hogwarts <laughs> the, okay there's some there's some interesting imagery there there's some interesting special effects there that could have built a world that was halfway to wondrous but you spend the majority of the movie at this stupid san francisco startup yeah there's yeah. definitely no not yeah. as much of a fantasy slant as the trailer would have you think um kind of like, underwhelming in that respect there's these attempts at uh, social commentary on corporate diversity. I, I, my favorite part was the news network was M M M B C uh, S C N M B S C N instead of C N B C or M S N B C or C N N. I missed that one. Yeah. And they well, so they make some commentary on on corporate diversity and forced diversity, not understanding that they're part of a corporate structure that does exactly that. 
I mean, I think it was clever to scrutinize diversity in like diversity practices in corporate culture. But they're not but because they also criticize flat. they also criticize the concept of meritocracy, where they say that Jason that word, yeah. he said they said he's a free market psychopath who believes in meritocracy. Yeah, yeah, but the ironic part is that his work wife, Lizzie, is in actuality so much better at her job than mm -hmm. he is, and she gets passed up on the opportunity to present her ideas to the CEO. However, this is just totally out of touch with the reality of how the tech industry especially yes. works these days, mm -hmm. which of course would have given her every opportunity even if she didn't deserve it. So mm -hmm. it's just totally out of touch with reality. And satire doesn't work when it's not grounded in some aspects of the real world because what was most confusing for me about watching this, I couldn't tell if it was satirizing uh, the way that the real world works and like something that black people actually think they experience in real life or if it's satirizing what a an ethno narcissist would make a subjective read on reality due to their critical theory worldview yeah mm -hmm. in that way it would have been funny but if you're laughing at your own interpretation of the joke instead of the joke itself is it really funny um, My problem with this, this is where Hollywood, the biggest failure they've had in the last 10 to 20 years is the inability to share characters with actual character flaws without turning them into caricatures, right? I watch all of these old shows. There are shows that I watch where characters can genuinely have bigoted, sometimes even racist views, mm -hmm. but they have redeeming qualities that make them a complete person. All and, the often time, and oftentimes the point of that is if you take a character that has some bigoted or awful views, but you make them a more full person in other ways, that allows them to grow into the show and become a better person where they both raise up the qualities that they do well and learn from the things that they do bad. And they don't do that here. The ability to show a character with any level of nuance is gone. Every character isn't even racist. They're just selfish and don't listen to other people. I'm not even kidding you. They're not bad people. They're just stupid and selfish. Which is most people. And I think that... Um, primarily, like, you don't sympathize with Aaron, Justice Smith's character, mm -hmm. because he's such a timid beta male doormat. And you can clearly see that the reason people treat him dismissively is because of his weak personality and his palpable insecurities, not because of his race. Well, and... I like there are plenty of overly accommodating doormat white males out there, yes. if not more in real life. That's just it. And that's what struck <laughs> me was there were moments and we were all the three, the three of us sitting there last night watching it. And there were moments where we were, you know, laughing and chuckling at some of the jokes. And I, the first 15, 20 minutes, I thought, OK, this this could be funny. This could be interesting. I thought the set the premise was good, but then it just it just zoned out. It went 30 minutes too long. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, this idea that uh, Aaron, the main character in the movie, was the way he was because of, as they presented it, an innate fear of white people uh, versus what you just said. He was just a timid, shy guy, mm -hmm. like some guys are. And, and they tried to build this out, and it just, the movie just didn't work. And I think I even made a comment to you earlier, Brett. If they wanted to play this idea that the biggest fear that these folks had in the society was is that white people were going to kill them at any moment and they had to calm them down that was their whole job so they the black people wouldn't die uh set it during the civil war set it during you know yeah. set it during a time when you had like the clan running around actively everywhere doing this yeah, kind of stuff then it would have worked no, they act as if no progress has been made right. in the last however many decades right that's yeah. that's, that's a problem why also like the, so the idea here is that there is a, a lot of cri criticism as to whether the romance story the rom-com element of this was it a distraction from the message or was it a worthy add, uh, add on to the story I would argue that if they leaned more into the rom-com bit and away from the social commentary they would have gotten a much better more well-rounded movie that could have brought in right. a wider audience but i don't think they well want you that. you don't get a sense that there's anything real or authentic to the connection between aaron and lizzie because it seems like they're just falling in love on the basic basis that 
she is an ethnically ambiguous woman and therefore they can relate on the fact that they're both unfairly dismissed or oppressed and well except for the fact that lizzie is actually talented and aaron is not but there's a 12, then, uh, 20 dollar here from uh Shashmiel. It was basically an overstretched Key and Peele skit. It was not, but not funny. As good. It was nowhere near as good. <laughs> if Key and Peele had done it, yeah, it would have been It didn't accomplish yeah. anything that Jordan Peele could have accomplished, like with Get Out. Key and um, Peele did a skit about this trope that's far superior yeah. to this. Film. But basically, to spoil it for you, at the end of the movie, um, Lizzie you find out is part of a different secret society, the So Swag Society of Supportive Wives and Girlfriends. So that ultimately proves that even their love is fake and every relationship is fake. There's no authenticity or connection. There are no loving relationships because they all can be boiled down to power dynamics. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get the grievance cinematic universe. And I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm here for it. The GCU. Yeah, there the you go. GCU. And it's just... <sighs> To me, the funny thing is, like, there was, there was the music in this show was, it was like they were like, can you make like Harry Potter music? And it's <laughs> supposed to be like whimsical, mm -hmm. except for the entire premise of the movie is mean spirited and, and cynical. And the music is at complete odds with it, which leads you unable to discern an actual tone in anything. Yeah. Right. He he has a. I will give Justice Smith some credit. Okay. So he he has a um an outburst at the end. The the climax of this movie where he basically finally gets everything off his chest and says everything he thought he 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 realizes he needs to say to everyone mm -hmm. to the detriment of his job. There is a, a good amount of like um, change between his timid self and the assertive self, but it's not so broad that it looks like a completely different person. It felt like a person who's been timid their whole life finally speaking up for the first time rather than somebody who's actually a more self-confident person playing a timid person. Does that make sure. sense? Mm -hmm. That was fine. But the rest of it, if you had turned these characters, the Jason, his his dumb co-worker who keeps getting all the credit, who keeps doing everything right because of his evil white privilege, if you had turned him into a real person, if you had gave him some redeeming qualities rather than making him a characteristic buffoon, you could have actually gotten to some truth here. You will never do this as well as they did in the 90s and the 2000s because they didn't have a deep, unabiding hatred for people that either didn't look like them, came from a different social class, or lived in a different part of the country or the world, okay? Mm -hmm. You will never understand this. Also, Aaron's ultimate speech there, where he's getting everything off his chest, it would have hit harder if it didn't come off as so self-pitying. It wasn't so... set up well. Ugh, like it just grossed me out like he and he was saying all of these lines that you've heard on Twitter like I have grown up in a country that constantly made me feel like it wanted me dead and that's the key word it made me feel like that but, but is that reality I actually I, my notes I said is that so is that your fault or is that society's fault who's the criminal right. in this? well no it, that's what struck me when y'all were talking about that is that it, that wasn't even set up at all in the movie Right. That was set up because David Allen Greer's character was telling him that the whole movie. There was nothing from Aaron's life that showed that. It, he was just a timid, meek guy. Mm -hmm. And then somebody put all that stuff in his head, and he has that outburst at the end. Nobody ever showed us, like, why, did, why would Aaron have felt that he was that scared of white people? What had ever happened to he's him? Just they scared never of set the world. that up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's not scared of white people. He's scared of the world in general. He's scared of people because he's But he focused insecure. it down on white people at the end because that's what, it's, the movie was built it, from it, the message point first, yes. wrap it in some Harry yeah. Potter, and then we need to jam a rom-com in here to move it from point A to B. I'm telling you, that's probably how this movie was structured. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye guys.